Good afternoon, class. Let me put this in slide mode. We are looking at section 4.2, how derivatives affect the shape of a graph. So we covered 4.1, maximum and minimum values. We are going to move on to how derivatives affect the shape of a graph. Again, bunch of differentiation formulas. Differentials, dy is f prime of x dx. The difference between dy and delta y is explained here in this graph. If this point has coordinates a and f of a, using point slope, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x sub 1, we can come up with the linearization, which refers to the tangent line, and you call it L of x. Instead of memorizing that, we can stick with the uh, elementary algebra point slope form of a line. Minimum or maximum points on a curve. We have defined the relative extrema. Peaks and valleys are local extrema. So this is local mean, this is local max, this is local mean, this is local max. Peaks and valleys are in the interior part of the graph. In the, and it can't happen at the inputs. Absolute or global values refer to the absolute extremum in the entire domain. So as we look at this one, again, peaks and valleys, local mean, local max, local mean. This one is also an absolute mean because there is no other point having a lower y coordinate. Peaks and valleys, local max, local mean, local max. This one happened to be an absolute max because no other point has a larger Y coordinate. A critical point is defined as a point where f prime is either zero or does not exist. To find any critical point, number one, we differentiate. Number two, we look at where f prime is zero. Number three, where we, we look at where f prime does not exist. In the case of a case of an extreme value theorem, also known as closed interval method, if you happen to have a continuous function in a closed interval of a to b, we must have an absolute max as well as absolute mean. The process is to find the CPs, evaluate the function at the end points a and b as well as the critical points. Absolute max is the largest value. Absolute mean is the smallest value. So this is the synopsis of what we have done. And here's the synopsis of what's happening in this section. How derivatives affect the shape of a graph. Theorem, a function f is increasing where f prime is positive, decreasing where f prime is negative. You remember that from before. So increasing versus decreasing. The graph almost looks like a line with a positive slope here and almost looks like a line with a negative slope. A critical point C of a function is a point 
or which f prime is either zero or <laughs> does not exist. A relative max or relative mean is a critical point at the top or bottom of an interval of a graph. A function is concave up where f double prime is positive, meaning f prime is increasing. A function is concave down where f double prime is negative, meaning f prime is decreasing. So this, in essence, like concave up can hold water. This one cannot. An inflection point C is a point where con concavity changes. Inflection points occur where F double prime is zero or F double prime does not exist. B and E, something like that, looking like that. This would be the point of inflection, everybody. So that is the summary of the section. Concave up. The graph of f of x lies above all its tangent lines on an open interval. Concave down. The graph of f of x lies below all of its tangent lines on an open interval. So if you look at this case, if you draw any tangent line, it seems to be at top of it. Look at this too. So that's the concept of a concave up. Whereas in these two cases, it's below all of its tangent lines, okay? Above versus below. So very straightforward, everybody. All right. Let's look at this case, concave up, right? The graph is above all its tangent lines. Notice what happens. F double prime is positive. F prime is increasing. So this is the curve. This is the function. If you look at this one, this one represents F prime at this point, right? That's the slope of a tangent line. So if you were to guesstimate the value of f prime here, it's positive. f prime is also positive here, but this one is more steep. So f prime has a positive value here, but a more positive value here. So it's increasing. Whereas here, again, more steep, okay, less steep, and this is more negative times than this one. So f prime is increasing. On the other hand, if you look at this case or this case, the graph of f of x lies below all of its tangent. And in the case of f double prime being negative means f prime is decreasing. So for example, right here, this has a negative slope. This also has a negative slope, but it's more steep and it has a more, it, the more negative in essence. Whereas this one is the other way around. A point P on a continuous curve, f of x is an inflection point if f of x changes concavity there. So for example, here, so this one is concave up, then becomes concave down. This portion is concave up, this portion is concave down. So when it changes, it gives us an inflection point. Steps to curve sketching in, in addition to what we know already from pre-calculus. Find the relative max and mean and intervals which the function increases and decreases. Set f prime equal to zero and solve for x. <clears throat> Make a sine graph. We've already discussed the sine graph, which is the number line and test values. 
between critical numbers or subintervals, <clears throat> find inflection points, which means set f double prime equal to zero and solving for x. And again, make a sign graph to, to find possible inflection points or IPs and where the function is concave up or concave down, put them all together and sketch the graph. So this is the synopsis of the curve sketch. Extreme values of a function are created when the function changes from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing. So notice the function is increasing, the function is decreasing. So what happens here? It's an extreme value in this specific case would be a local max. Decreasing, increasing, it gives rise to this point, which is an extreme value. More specifically, minimum. Local max, local mean. Notice what happens. Decreasing, increasing, decreasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. <clears throat> so as it changes, it creates an extreme value. This is the local mean. As it changes from increasing to decreasing, also creates an extreme value. This is the local max. Increasing, decreasing, increasing, in, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. So this creates a, from increasing to decreasing, creates a local max. From decreasing to increasing, creates a local mean. From increasing to decreasing, creates a local max. So here's the theorem. A function is increasing where f prime is positive and it is decreasing where f prime is negative. We've already discussed that. As far as the proof is concerned, and it's by MVT, the mean value theorem. When f is continuous on the closed interval of a to B and differentiable on T open interval of A to B. F prime has this value. Cross product will give us this. By definition, as you recall, the concept of increasing means when X gets larger, Y gets larger. So if V is larger than A, if we know V is on the right side of A, B is larger than A. If F prime is positive, so this B minus A is positive, F prime is positive, their product is positive, right? Then F of B minus F of A is positive. And f of b is larger than f of a, which makes it increasing. Believe it or not, that's the proof. You don't have to worry about that, but understand what's happening here. If f prime is positive and b is larger than a, the product of these two pieces is positive, makes this one positive, makes f of b be larger than f of a. And that's the definition of x gets larger, y gets larger. First derivative test, y prime or f prime is positive, curve is rising because it's increasing. y prime or f prime is negative, curve is falling, which means it's decreasing. So it gives rise to 
اللوكال ماكس if we start with y prime or f prime being negative where curve is falling first and then y prime or f prime is positive where curve is rising second then it gives rise to this local mean where y prime or f prime is zero or doesn't exist. That's a possible location of a local max or mean. How do we know that? We have to do sine graph to find this out. Okay, we want to test to see whether a graph is concave up or down. This is called concavity test and we need the second derivative y double prime or f double prime. If it happened to be positive curve is concave up, looks like that in that vicinity. If it's negative, the curve is concave down, looking like that. If it's zero or does not exist, it's a possible inflection point where concavity changes. For example, right here, you see that it changes right at this point. Over here is concave down and it changes to concave up. This is called IP the inflection point. A function is concave up where f double prime is positive, f prime is increasing, a function is concave down where f double prime is negative or f prime is decreasing. So this is the test of concave. We don't want to mix it up with the second derivative test, okay? And again, as always, use the sine graph. And I will show you as we come across a simple example, we go through the process. But we have to use the sine graph for this test. Second derivative test. We evaluate the function at CPs, okay, by the function, we mean the second derivative. In other words, we've found the critical points and we put it into F double prime or Y double prime. Evaluate the function by this function, we mean f double prime. Okay, y f double prime. This is what we mean by say, okay, the same, the second derivative at the critical point. It's either negative or positive. If it's negative, graph is concave down. The value of that CP, the critical point, is a local max. If it's positive, it's concave up, it's a local mean. Because if it's a local max, it looks like that, everybody. If it's a local mean, it looks like that, right? So concave down means max, concave up means mean. This is local, again, in that vicinity, okay, in that vicinity, everybody. Okay. 
All right, before we move on to graphing, let's look at some information from algebra to remind you what you have seen as some theorems. One of them is called the end behavior. Can somebody read this for us, please? Re read what again? Sorry. Read the recall, please. This oh. paragraph. Thanks. The end behavior of a polymal uh, function is uh, the behavior of the graph of f of x as x approaches positive infinity or negative fin infinity. The degree and leading coefficient of a polynomial uh, function determines the end behavior of the graph. Uh, you have to read the actual function. Perfect. That's fine. Perfect. Good. So this is something we studied before. If you look at this function, which is a polynomial of degree n, the leading term is the first one if we put it in descending order. So a sub n, y equals a sub n, x sub n. Ultimately, the graph will look like this. That's the concept that we have learned in algebra. That's the concept of the end behavior. So it depends on a couple of things. If you look at this one, a sub n, this number, this coefficient is positive. And the end behavior looks like y or f of x equals x squared. This looks like f of x equals x squared. Which means if I change this to, uh, let's say this one is 10x to the power of, I don't know, 8. Ultimately, looks like that. Meaning, this is the first and this is the second quadrant. When x goes to negative infinity, that means x goes this way. f of x or y goes to infinity. When x goes to infinity, f of x or y goes up to infinity. So, this first term, the leading term will take over. If this is positive, and this is even, even power, that's the way it looks like. Now, if a sub n is negative, then this flips over. Example, f of x equals minus x squared. Everybody knows f of x equals x squared looks like that. f of x equals minus x squared looks like that. So just as an example, if I were to say, for example, y equals 10x to the power of 8, the end behavior looks like this, but y equals minus 10 x to the power of 8. The end behavior looks like this. Okay. If it's of odd power, okay, that means this n is odd, three, five, seven, you name it. And a sub n is positive, this looks like an example, f of x equals x cubed, which means as x goes to negative infinity, so does y, this is the uh, n behavior. As x goes to negative infinity, so does y. And as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to infinity. Okay, this has to be fixed, everybody. Okay. And when a sub n is negative, for example, 
minus x cube. It looks like that. So when x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. And when x goes to infinity, y goes to negative infinity. So this was called the end behavior. I hope everybody remembers that. We also have a theorem known as behavior near a zero, near an x-intercept. It depends on the multiplicity. Multiplicity refers to this exponent, x minus c to the power of m. This gives you x equals c. So if m is odd, f crosses the x-axis at c0. If m is even, this exponent, f does not cross the x-axis at c0. This is from algebra, everybody. Okay, and I hope everybody remembers them. So, as you can see, for example, in this case, the degree is one and it crosses. In this case, the degree is even two and it bounces back. In this case, the degree is three, which is an odd number again, and it crosses at that point, okay? Three graphs showing three different polynomial functions with multiplicity one, two, and three. What matters again, whether this is odd or even. The higher the multiplicity, the flatter the curve is at the zero. The sum of the multiplicities is the degree of the polynomial function. So these are some stuff that I hope everybody remembers from before, from algebra, so it can help us move on uh, with the graph. So I want to go over uh, the... steps in graphing first using uh, prior knowledge of mathematics and then we add the new stuff so if i'm interested in graphing this function class y equals x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4 first i really have to factor it it's been given to me in a factored form so it makes life easier so what I'm going to do, I'm going to graph this without calculus because you should be able to graph this roughly, okay? And then I pay attention to what the uh, calculus does. So we go with more details. So if I were to graph this uh, just the way it's given, first and foremost, I need to find my intercepts, everybody. I need to find all of my intercepts. So clearly, this one gives me minus one zero. This one gives me two zero. And then if I want the y intercept, if I replace the x with zero, I get one here, I get minus two squared. So let me make sure everybody understands what I'm trying to say here. So if I said, I'm gonna replace the x with zero here, I will get four, but it clearly gives you four right here. So I have three intercepts. Two of them are X intercepts. One of them is the Y intercept. Again, finding the Y intercept, everybody is easier here. But even if you do it here, zero means one here, zero means negative two here, negative two squared is positive four times one is four. So if I were to use just that information to begin with, let me try to sort of craft this. It may not be to scale, but uh, I'll give it a shot. So. So we have negative one zero. No, this is sorry, I meant two. 
to zero. Zero four. Now, the thing I want to, there are a couple of things I want to add. When we look at this one has a multiplicity too. So I'm going to write M. So we, the notation we use everybody for this one is that we use M equals two. Multiplicity is even. So what it means is that, and this is the notation that we use in calculus. You put the arrow there, that means when we get there, uh, it can't cross. So if we're coming from this way, it, cross, it you know bounces back. If we're coming this way, it bounces back down, okay? This is completely a pre-calculus college algebra, okay? Uh, one more thing, and that is X cubed. This is your, First term, the leading term. So the graph looks like that, which means the first and the third quadrant. So with that, because, because a sub n equals one, which is positive. So what it means is that if you look at those arrows, they are telling the reader that we have those n behaviors. And so if I were to graph it, roughly this goes this way, it can't cross, it bounces back up. Now, when it comes back up, three things happen has to go through this and it comes down and it crosses negative one zero. Now, three things happens. One is that it peaks somewhere here. One is that it peaks at this point. And the third way is that the, it crosses and it peaks somewhere in the second quadrant. So whether the top is here, here, or here, we have no idea. So how do we find that? With calculus. So what happens is that now we add the calculus, the graph becomes much more detailed. Again, this is a rough sketch from prior knowledge of mathematics, pre-calculus for college algebra. I'm gonna clean up the mess and do it with details using calculus. So I just wanted to make sure we know that it can be done with the prior knowledge of mathematics. So, all right, so what do we have to do first and foremost, we are going to find CPs, the critical points require differentiation. So we are going to differentiate this into three X squared minus six X. To set this equal to zero, in order to find the critical points, we factor the three X out and X is either zero or two. So we have two critical points. Now we do the first derivative test, which is a sine graph, everybody. First derivative test. So we're gonna put X here, F prime of X here, a number line here at X equals zero, f prime is zero at x equals two, f prime is zero. So basically what we need to do is to find out, see right now we have to the left of zero between the two numbers, to the right of two, we have three sub intervals. We wanna see what's happening here, what's happening here, what's happening here. That means what is the sign for f prime, positive, negative, positive, negative, what, what do we need? And so what we need to do we need to pick up a test point. So I'm going to call it TP. And to the left of zero, for example, minus one, between the two, one, and beyond that is three. And what is important to know as far as basic math is concerned, if you see X has 
exponent one, x minus two as exponent one. So they will alternate. Even if you find one of them, the rest of them alternate. For example, if I put the negative one, either in this expression, in this expression, or you put it here, it doesn't matter. So if you put negative one here, this is negative. Negative mi minus one minus one is negative. Negative times negative makes it positive times three is positive. So this is positive, everybody. <clears throat> the rest of them will alternate. But even if I were to use, for example, this one and plug in, please understand one, this is one minus two negative. So negative times positive makes it negative and so on. So if those are the case, I like to use arrows. Up means positive, arrow down means negative. It will help me see that when we go up and down, increasing and decreasing, this is the location of a local max. When we go down and up, this is the location of a local mean, meaning. At x equals zero, we have a local max. So then what do you do? You plug it into the original function. If I plug in zero, it gives me four. So local max is the y coordinate here which is four at zero, four. Arrow down, arrow up. The local mean occurs at x equals two. So if I plug in two here, we already know two gives us zero. So the local mean is equal to the y coordinate of that zero at either you write x equals two or the pair. The first derivative test gives us a lot of information. What else does it give us? Intervals of increasing, decreasing. Positive means increasing. Negative means decreasing. So the function is increasing here from negative infinity to zero, union two to infinity. And it's decreasing here from zero to two. So that's another piece of information which is extremely important. The function is increasing from minus infinity to zero, union two to infinity, in between is decreasing. So the first derivative test gave us a lot of information class. Okay? The first derivative test gave us a lot of information. We're going to continue on that thoughts. And I'm going to write everything from the previous page. So I'm moving on. So I have the function. I have the derivative. And I have my critical points. I've already done the first derivative test. But I want to show you the second derivative test. And I'm going to tell you that don't use it for graphs. But it's an excellent tool for applications, you'll see that. Why should you not use it for graphs? Because it gives you half of the information of the first derivative. Again, the first derivative test not only gives us local extrema, it also gives us intervals of increasing, decreasing. Now the second derivative test doesn't give us this part. What does it tell us? Well, F double prime of C is positive means concave up relative mean. F double, F double prime of C is negative. That means concave down relative max. What do I mean by that? Here's Y prime. Let's find Y double prime. 6X minus 6. We already found the critical points are 0 and 2. Plug in 0 becomes negative six. What we are interested in is whether it's negative or positive. When F double prime or Y double prime is negative, means the graph is concave down. That means at zero, at x equals zero, 
we have a local max. If you plug in, it gives you four. This means zero comma four. And again, this zero goes back in the original function is a local max. Again, why is that? Because concave down, everybody. Concave down looks like that. So this is a local max. You see that? On the other hand, if I put number two into y double prime, I get two times six minus six, and it's positive. Well, minus six is six. When it's positive, means it's concave up, and that means a relative minimum. Concave up, relative minimum. Now, of course, this two has to go back to the original function, and it gives you the pair. So the pair comes from the original function, everybody. And so, again, concave up means it looks like that. And that's what's happening. Okay? So, one more time. This is the second derivative test. It after you find the critical points, you put the critical points into y double prime. When it's positive, it means concave up and local mean. When it's negative, it means concave down and local max. But it doesn't give you intervals of increasing, decreasing. So please, you don't have to use this for graphs, but it does have a lot of applications in application because it makes it easy. The next part is to find inflection points. So what have we done so far? Here's the function, everybody. Here's y prime, here's y double prime. We've done those. And if f double prime is negative, it's concave down. If it's positive, it's concave up. This is the information we have. So what we are going to do, we are going to set this equal to zero which results in x being 1. And now we are going to do the sine graph on y double prime to see where the function is concave up, where the function is concave down. So to do so, the possible inflection point is x equals 1. The reason we say possible, because we don't know yet until we do the sine graph. OK, everybody? We don't know yet until we do the sine graph. And that's what we are going to do. So here's the sine graph. We're going to put 1 here. And at 1, when x is 1, y double prime is 0. So we are going to pick a test point, TP, short for test point. And to the left of one, the easiest point would be zero. And if you plug in zero into y double prime, becomes six times zero minus six becomes negative. So it's negative here. And to the right of one, the easiest point would be two. So this means negative, right? And to the right, the easiest point would be two. And if you plug in 2 into y double prime, you get positive 6. So negative versus positive. When y double prime is negative, means concave down. So it's concave down here, meaning from negative infinity to one. This is a number line class, okay? If we want to be more specific, this is minus infinity, this is positive infinity, and according to the number line, from negative infinity to one, it's concave down because it's negative, right? From one to infinity, concave up. Because the concavity changes from concave 
down to, uh, and I can write it here. So it's concave down here, concave up here. Because of the change, then this is a point of inflection. The point of inflection is that x equals 1. What is the pair? What is the y coordinate, everybody? Plug in 1 here or here. If I plug in 1 here, I get 1 cubed minus 3 times 1 squared plus 4. I get 1 minus 3 plus 4, which is positive 2. So the pair is 1 comma 2, everybody. The pair is 1 comma 2. So we're going to put all of this together. We are going to put everything together and we are going to graph this. Is everybody okay up to here? All right. Let's see what we have. First of all, here's the function. Second, this is the derivative function. This is the second derivative. Here's the intercepts we came up with. Here's where the function is increasing. Here's where the function is decreasing. And here's concave down, concave up. So intercepts, negative one, zero, two, zero, zero, four. Increasing from negative infinity to zero, union two to infinity, decreasing from zero to two. Concave down from negative infinity to one, concave up from one to infinity. And so, in order to graph it, I like to make a summary table, meaning I'm going to put in all the pairs that I've found so far. So, for example, x-intercept is at minus 1, 0. And I like to go in order. Y-intercept is at 0, 4. So I'm going to go from left to right. So that's the y-intercept. The IP, if you recall, we found it in the previous page at 1, 2. 1, 2. Okay. By the way, because it's a max, whether it's max or mean, we go with an arrow that represents the max or mean. Here's the IP inflection point. The other x-intercept was at 2, 0. And as you recall, it is not only an x-intercept, it is also a mean. And again, I'm going to put an arrow. The concept of an arrow is that it can't cross that, OK? And then we're done with those points. I picked up an extra point. You don't have to do that. So for example, if you plug in 3 here and you work it out, by the way, it may be easier that you plug it in this one, 3 plus 1 is four, three minus two is one squared is one. So if you plug it in here, you get three, four. So that's the last point. And we know those are the end behavior. So the graph looks like that. Notice, notice, we have all the intercepts, x-intercepts, y-intercept, okay? Also, here's the max, here's the mean, and here's the inflection point. Notice this is, Concave down, and it changes to concave up. Also notice, increasing from minus infinity to zero. So this is increasing, right? This part is increasing. Also, this part is increasing to, to infinity. That's why we have that. And this is the only portion which is decreasing, zero to two. We have that one as well. 